Hi, and here we are at chapter two, um, and here we're going to be talking about paradigms um, that help us understand mental disorder, and I just want to take a moment to just uh, think about that word paradigms, because I suspect many of you may not be aware, of, not familiar with that word. Um, and another, you know, paradigms are essentially theories, um, but but in a broader way, they're ways of understanding something. And so um, in this case, right, we're trying to understand mental disorder. Paradigms is a structure of thought um, or a um, an organized set of ideas that help us to understand that. And um, I want to just kind of talk for a few minutes. As we talk about each of the paradigms, it's going to sound as if we have to choose among them, um, but that's not the case. And, and, and while there are uh, therapists, there are clinicians who might adhere strictly to a single paradigm, that's actually pretty rare. And most clinicians are going to, uh, uh, you know, approach an individual perhaps with um, curiosity about which paradigm is going to best um, help them understand this person or more practically which paradigm is going to offer um, treatment tools that will help this person um, and and again there are some people who are staunch behaviorists like all they do is behaviorism um, you know um, some of you may have interest, and I think at least one of you has told me you do, in becoming a behavioral analyst. And in that case, you're really just using the paradigm of behaviorism to understand um, usually a very narrowly defined set of disorders. Um, but people in general practice, you know, while some people might be more psychodynamic or psychoanalytic, um, I, I think most clinicians I know, and myself included, may have a kind of baseline way of understanding people. But certainly when it comes to therapy, I think um, most really competent therapists have a toolbox and they reach into that toolbox um, looking for something that will help them understand and help them intervene with the person in front of them and sometimes that's going to be something more um, psychodynamic where they're looking for insight and helping with insight and other times it's going to be more behavioral or cognitive behavioral tools um, and other times it might be um, a biological understanding that then informs the use of medication um, and it might be a combination of all of those at different times in the therapy so i want you to kind of have that in the back of your mind as we move through um, and in this video we're going to focus um, more on non-biologics um, and, and we'll get to biological eventually. So hopefully some most of you have some beginning understanding of Freud and his ideas. Um, this is not my theories of personality class where we would spend quite a bit of time talking about Freud and related theories. Uh, you and I are really going to just give an overview and think about how it informs treatment. Um, and we will come back to that at times throughout the course. Um, so, you know, so I, I don't know, obviously, what your backgrounds are about Freud, but Freud is uh, the first, really, to um, talk about psychology in the ways in which we are familiar with psychology as a field. Um, he's certainly the first theory to offer um, ideas about um what mental illness is and tying it to internal factors um, and underlying uh, personality dynamics that may be driving um, that disorder in some way. And his ideas for treatment stem from that. Um, and when we think about psychoanalysis um, and Freud's ideas, there are some very main, kind of central ideas that you and I um, will make use of. Um, and the first is simply the idea that the unconscious um, is important. Um, the idea that factors outside of the person's awareness may be um, influencing uh, their mental health and causing specific symptoms. Um, and so if somebody is anxious, a uh, Freudian therapist, a psychoanalytic therapist, is going to be very interested in what factors the person is are, you know, outside the person's awareness that may um, that may be forming that anxiety. And is there something in their history that they're not linking it to? Um, is there something um, going on currently that is driving a baseline anxiety that then is essentially landing on a specific thing in their life that, that uh, they're identifying as being anxiety provoking, but in fact, there's something else um, kind of off in the wings or in the background driving that. Um, and, and related to that is the idea that 
childhood is really important. Um, and Freud certainly emphasized the idea that things that happen earlier in our life have more of a role in shaping our personality. Um, interestingly, modern child development theories and certainly modern um, brain development theories um, concur with that now, that um, our brain, in fact, is being shaped in more significant ways in the first five years of life then later in life, and, and that's the years Freud pointed to as being really important for personality development. He certainly wasn't talking about um, brain elasticity and, and the things that modern neuroscience might point us to, but he was pointing to the same time period. Um, and so this idea that early childhood is really important, but you know that doesn't mean that, that if you're in therapy with somebody who has um, is making use of psychoanalytic tools, um, that they're always going to want to bring everything back to your mother and that kind of caricature of therapy. Um, but it does mean that the things that happen early in our life um, are interesting in the therapy. Uh, and so um, and so they do come up. Um, it's, uh, psychoanalytic theorists are also really interested in defense mechanisms, and defense mechanisms essentially um, are things we use um, to protect ourselves uh, from unconscious material that would otherwise be upsetting. Um, and in therapy, um, you know, a psychoanalytically informed therapy may interpret um, things like lateness to sessions or missed sessions um, as meaningful in some way if they seem to be related to defense mechanisms. I've certainly had my own client, you know, I've had lots of clients who miss sessions or are late to sessions um, and it doesn't feel meaningful to me. But I've also had clients where we have a particularly um, either important or maybe emotionally difficult session and then the next week um, they cancel and that becomes a pattern where every time we have a very productive and, and potentially emotionally draining um, or trying uh, session that then we have a disruption to therapy that follows that and that's you know that's it's hard not to interpret that when that happens um, in terms of defense um, and defense mechanisms are important because they tell you that there's something there that feels overwhelming um, and that's that's really you know kind of meaningful um, and might help you understand other things in the person's life um, so you know, when we talk about psychoanalytic treatment, we're talking about Freud's um, very uh, classic theories, um, and those and and that treatment really does help in the way that we've been kind of hinting at in the last slide. Um, the person become aware of unconscious material. The goal of psychoanalytic ther ther therapy is to make the unconscious conscious, um, and the idea is that when we are aware of um, struggle, we're aware of uh, history or material that is making us struggle, then we have options. We have the ability to choose how to behave in response to it. As long as it's unconscious, we can't make choices and, and we're just kind of um, going along, uh, not understanding or realizing uh, what's shaping our behavior. Um, and so awareness, insight is uh, the central tool of psychoanalytic treatment. Um, and, and to achieve that goal, essentially, this is talk therapy, right? And very traditionally, this would be talk therapy where somebody is lying on a couch with their back to the therapist um, to make the therapist as, um, to, it, to minimize the therapist's intrusiveness as much as possible. Um, that's not, that's a very rare thing. It still happens. There's some people who practice that way, um, but it's very uncommon. And, um, you know, in, even for therapists who are using psychoanalytic tools, now it's, this is likely to be a face-to-face -face conversation but the therapist's main goal is to be listening for patterns of behavior patterns of emotion that might reveal underlying issues and and when i think of this the example i often think of um because i much of my therapy not all of it but much of my therapy um is kind of psychoanalytically informed um but but what that looks like is that I'm looking for patterns. Um, and I can remember a client of mine who um, struggled with uh, obsessive compulsive disorder and depression um, and had for many years when I met her. And I noticed a pattern that every time she went to visit her parents who lived out of state, um, she would have a resurgence of symptoms and um, and would really not function very well uh, for a period of time afterwards. And I kept observing this to her. I kept saying, I think that there's a pattern here. It seems to me that. And she kept um, denying it. She kept saying that it wasn't a useful interpretation. It wasn't a useful piece of insight for her. Um, and that culminated once with her um, coming back from her parents and being so um, depressed and, and having her, um, her obsessive compulsive symptoms 
um, so present that she couldn't get home, um, that she was engaging in ritual and engaging in obsessions in such a way that she had to um, actually find a hotel. She couldn't keep driving. Um, and, um, and at that point we had a more productive conversation the next session about the fact that now she saw that perhaps there was a pattern. And that is, I think, the experience of talk therapy, of inside oriented therapy. Of, of kind of a circular, you keep coming back, the therapist keeps making gentle observations um, and waits essentially for the person to be able to incorporate that and hear that in useful ways so that it's not an argument, it's not that they're insisting that something's true. Um, and, and there are theories, theorists that come after Freud, um, again, in my theories of personality class, those of you that have taken that, um, you'll be familiar with names like Jung um, and Adler and Horney and Erickson. Um, but these theorists are psychoanalytic theorists in the sense, or psychodynamic theorists in the sense that they built on Freud's ideas, but they have the central belief system that the Conscious is important, that childhood development is important, um, and that mental illness stems from unconscious forces and things um, in our often distant past. Um, and, and so all of these will involve talk therapy. There's a different twist on each of the theories, but together they're often referred to as psychodynamic theories. Um, and anytime anybody's talking about insight oriented therapy, um, this is the kind of therapy they're talking about, um, something that's psychoanalytically or psychodynamically informed. Um, so we're going to pause there, and uh, the next video is going to talk, um, going to pick up with talking about behaviorism, um, and I'll see you there.